programmed this and the upcoming talks to showcase the breadth of the collections held at Bart's Health Archives and to highlight some of the fascinating work of our researchers. So I'm just going to give a very brief introduction to the service for those of you who may not be familiar with us. The archives cared for by Bart's Health are amongst the largest hospital collections in the UK and amongst only a handful managed within a hospital trust. We hold records dating from 1137, shortly after the foundation of our oldest hospital, St Bartholomew's, to the current day, including records of over 30 hospitals. As well as records relating to hospital staff, patients, buildings and management, we hold records of many other institutions, charities, organisations and individuals relating to healthcare and training. The hospitals and organisations for which we hold records, many of which no longer exist, are primarily located in the city in East London and are managed by Bart's Health NHS Trust or were run by one of their predecessor authorities. The Royal Brompton, which you're going to hear a bit more about tonight, and its sister hospital, Harefield, as well as their associated authorities, have never been directly linked to Bart's Health or its predecessors, but their rich historic collections are managed by Bart's Health Archives through a partnership agreement. So that leads us on to the subject of tonight's talk. Uh, Giskin Day is a principal teaching fellow at Imperial College London, where she leads on medical humanities exploring the cultural context of medicine. She's also studying for a PhD in health sciences research at King's College London, which she's going to tell you a bit more about on a subject which I think has become especially relevant during the current pandemic uh, on gratitude in healthcare. So tonight she's going to talk to us about her experiences working with material from the historic archives of the Brompton Hospital and the findings of her research so far. So Giskin, I'm going to hand over to you now and ask you to sh start sharing your screen. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share this work, which I hugely enjoyed carrying out as part of my PhD. So tonight I plan to tell you a little bit about the background of the Brompton correspondence, what it consists of. I'll then move on to say a little bit about the work of the Almoner, who was one of the chief correspondents in uh, the letters that I examined as part of my research. I'll then share some insights and some stories from the letters and end with some take home messages before taking questions. So I intend to talk for about 35 minutes, so leaving plenty of time for questions at the end. So what is the Brompton Correspondence? Well, it's an archive of letters and they date from about 1905 to about 1959 and they're held on deposit at the Bart's Health Archive. And these letters were exchanged between the almoners, and I'll say a little bit more about who the almoner was, and former patients who were treated for tuberculosis at Frimley Sanatorium, which was part of the Brompton Hospital. And it's a huge archive. There are over 1,500 correspondents. I haven't counted how many actual letters there are, but there are many thousands. And I had a, the privilege of reading them all twice. So I'll first start with a little bit about how I came to know about the existence of the letters. And it was one of those things where you remember the time and the place. It was a real kind of light bulb moment for me. I'd been thinking about doing some research on gratitude for some time. As you can see, I'm a mature student. I've been teaching at Imperial for over 20 years. Uh, and I was really struck by really two things. I absolutely love teaching. I love the course that I teach and I love the privilege of teaching medical students. Uh, but my, a lot of my intrinsic satisfaction from the work comes from what the students give back. So their gratitude for the opportunity to study uh, medical humanities um, and the interactions we have uh, really means a lot to me on a, on a tough day. It's the kind of um, past students getting in touch and, and telling me what a difference it made to them that keep me going, that get me out of bed in the mornings. But I have been for some time worried about the lack of um, motivation of medical students or enthusiasm for continuing a career in, in healthcare. There's a huge recruitment crisis in the NHS and a huge retention problem. People tend to get demotivated. 
um, they they lose the the joy of the um, what they first came into the job wanting to do. It's a really tough profession, and there's a huge morale problem. And it occurred to me that gratitude could perhaps play a role in boosting the morale of healthcare workers. I'm not by any means advocating it as a panacea, but I think that we've gone too far in the complaints direction. In every hospital, there are formal mechanisms made for complaints. And of course, fixing things that go wrong, hugely important, and one needs to have that reporting process. But I do also think that we can learn a lot from compliments, from things that people appreciate about the care they've received. And often that is informal, it's under the wire, it doesn't get recorded, and yet there are valuable insights to be gained. So uh, I hoped really to make a difference with my study, just understanding the dynamics of gratitude as a social practice a bit better. And I was thinking about how to make this uh, study work. It seemed very kind of conceptual. Uh, I didn't know how to tackle it. And I was actually chatting to my friend here, Victoria Hume, who's the arts manager at the Brompton. She was for many years. And we worked together on some nice, nice workshops for students. And she, we were standing right here in the spot. And she told me uh, that when the building had been refurbished, uh, rumor goes that there was this filing cabinet of thank you letters that were discovered kind of long forgotten. And um, I got very excited at this point because it suddenly occurred to me that this might constitute a corpus, something I could start an investigation of gratitude at the Brompton from, and then perhaps expand it into comparing with what happens at the Brompton today. So I immediately rang up the archives and arranged to go and see these letters. So I'll just give you a little bit of context to how the letters came about. So the Brompton Hospital was, was established to treat TB consumption, and it was um, built with public funds, fully operational by 1854. The building that some of you may know and love today in Chelsea is actually across the road from the original Brompton building. The original building still stands, but now it is a complex of luxury flats, sign of the times, <laughs> but it is just opposite the road from the existing building. Now, it was quickly realized that patients treated at the Brompton for tuberculosis, many of them could do with further rehabilitation. And it was decided to establish a sanatorium out in the Surrey countryside. Uh, so the, that's how the Frimley Sanatorium was born. This is what it looked like. There's a really lovely phrase in the original design plans for the sanatorium, uh, saying that these pines provided grateful shade. And of course, I'm very alert to any mentions of gratitude. Um, but uh, what was great about the site was that it was ideal for uh, sanatorium conditions. The European sanatoriums, they were built along the lines of plenty of fresh air and light, and the air should be dry, and the pines were a good indicator of that. So Frimley Sanatorium opened as a sort of outpost of the Brompton in 1905. There was something very special about the treatment regimen that was pioneered at Frimley. It was called graduated labor. And this is where uh, I get in my title for this talk, the graft from, uh, because patients were expected to do hard graft. Well, it started off very with light duties. So these men in this picture are carrying baskets of moss. That was grade one. And then they were, stones were added to the baskets and gradually they increased the amount of work they did as part of their rehabilitation until they got all the way up to grade seven or eight. And those kind of duties involved wielding a pickaxe and uh, doing really quite hard building work. So for me, it was an ideal site for this. 
because you can see from this postcard that there were lots of market gardens uh, where the patients would grow the food. Uh, it was designed with this kind of plenty of access to light in mind. So these the star shape where the wings uh, receive plenty of light and um, patients really benefited from this wonderful environment. Plenty of good food as well, that was really important. Um, that was seen as part of the treatment. So graduated labor pioneered at Frimley, but it wasn't the only, uh, the only treatment available. Rest was still very important and there were certain hours of the day where patients were not allowed to leave their beds and they weren't even allowed to talk to each other during those periods. Uh, and the graduated labor was uh, carried out until just before the 1940. And then there was also this rather gruesome collapse treatment. I won't go into all the medical details, but it basically involves forcibly collapsing a lung so that it could heal. Um, so that was also carried out at Frimley. But the real revolution came with streptomycin, the use of antibiotics to treat tuberculosis. So whereas in 1905, when Frimley opened, survival was only 50%. Uh, by the time we got to the 1950s, it was about 80%. But gosh, they were almost able to cure it by the time uh, that streptomycin was being widely used. So with all these different treatments, it was really important to the doctors at Frimley to be able to tell what worked and what didn't. And it became imperative that patients that had been treated at Frimley were followed up after they'd left the sanatorium to find out how they were doing. This was a huge task. And in the early years of the sanatorium, a lot of patients managed to disperse and were never heard from again. In fact, 1,400 patients were deemed to be lost sight of by 1918. And this was a really unhappy situation. So with the help of a grant from the Medical Research Board, and now the Medical Research Council, uh, an almoner was appointed to keep track of patients that had left Frimley. So when the first almoner was appointed in 1920, she had the huge task of trying to trace the patients that had already been lost sight of. And she was incredibly successful. They managed to track down all but 10%. Now, when we say follow up, uh, patients that actually died were still recorded in the figures. They weren't lost to follow up. So it's a bit kind of, um, you've got to remember that with their success with the follow-up, it, it didn't mean that all of those people were still being correspond with, corresponded with because they'd survived. Many of them did die, especially in the early years. So what is the, or who is the almoner? The almoner, that I haven't come across any photographs of the Frimley almoners. Um, I hope to one day find some, if I get a chance to, to come back to the, to the archives. But um, this is a typical photograph of an almoner. And her primary task for, she was usually a lady and she was known as the lady almoner. In fact, she was exclusively, you know, they were all women. Um, she would make sure that patients that were being admitted for charitable treatment under the voluntary hospital system were eligible for charity. So she'd often interview them when they were admitted to the Brompton, she would do a sort of means test. And also at Frimley, very importantly, she would interview them at the point of discharge and remind them of their responsibilities to keep in touch with the Brompton in order for them to collect those statistics that were deemed vital for determining whether their TB treatment was being successful or not. So that is what the almoner did. The word almoner comes from arms, the giving of charity. Now I've written a, a lot more about the almoner in a paper that I've published on this work and we'll put a link in the chat. It's freely available. So hopefully there'll be no problem in accessing it if you're interested in more aspects of the almoner and her work. The almoner had a big job and um, I say almoner but actually there were a whole team of almoners 
And so much of this work seemed so bespoke that for many months, I thought that one person was in charge, but it turned out that there was a whole Armina department uh, busily working behind the scenes to uh, keep up all the records that were required. So here's a typical uh, page from a, 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 the Armina's book, and you can see how this patient, every year there's an update on their condition. So this would have started at the point of discharge. So when this patient being discharged, this book would open and their entries would start. And um, the Armanas at Frimley were remarkably successful. They followed up 15,000 patients over the course of 54 years with fewer than 6% overall being lost to follow up. So a, a remarkable success rate. Now, letters were not the only means by which the Armina stayed in touch with the patients. They would phone them on the telephone, they'd have telephones, and that was a, a good means of getting in touch. Uh, there was a network of dispensaries. So when patients, former patients came to get medication, the dispensary would report back to the Armina. And they also sent health visitors. So you might receive a visitor to check on your living conditions and see whether you were well and working. Those were the two key metrics. Had you survived? How were you doing? Did you still have sputum uh, or any signs of tuberculosis, still a notifiable disease? And were you able to work? So work was at the heart of what Frimley was all about. So now I'm going to uh, show a few examples of some stories and um, uh, themes that emerged in, the, in looking at all of these letters in this archive. So this is what the letters looked like when I first encountered them. There was a folder for each year of discharge and the letters for each patient were paper clipped together. Now, one of the things that makes this archive really special is that we have both sides of the correspondence. The Armina was diligent, or the Armina's clerk probably, in taking a carbon copy of every letter that went out. So although there are definitely gaps and there's missing correspondence, uh, it, it's, it's reasonably uh, complete. And we have these stacks of letters, often lifelong. So patients would correspond with the hospital until they died. That was often the last letter, was uh, a letter from a relative or the GP to say that the patient had passed away. And there are not just letters. There's a delightful variety of ephemera that I came across in the files as well. So patients would send postcards, holiday snaps, family photographs. And this is testament, I think, to the, rep the rapport that they had with the Amina, many of, of whom had never actually met the named Armina at the bottom of the letter. But there was still this ongoing relationship that the Arminas managed to cultivate very successfully. So labor was often at the heart of the things that the patients would write about. So here are a few quotes from the letters, just emphasizing how they had kept up the lessons that they'd learned at Frimley. Frimley made a man of me. I've kept fit because I was taught how to live at Frimley. So very much this kind of lifelong education about making one fend and work as soon as one is able to, and um, patients even suggesting how the regimen at Frimley might be improved. I cycle 26 miles to work and would like to suggest this as part of the treatment. So graft very much at, at the heart of many of the, the reports that patients sent in. This patient um, made me laugh because she spends many pages convincing the almoner at how young and useful she is, that she can still, well, she's still doing lots of gardening. She can run up the stairs two at a time and she feels as fit as she was 20 years ago. And few people will be convinced when I say that I'm over 52. Well, of course I'm 52 and I'm pleased to say I can also take the stairs two at a time, but then I haven't had the misfortune of suffering from TV. And she offers to call in and show the Armina how well she is. And she says how the medical director said that she thought she 
was using a false birth certificate and then it belonged to a relative just because she was so useful and uh, still so useful and youthful. So um, there was there were many uh, kind of uh, letters that that emphasized the usefulness of having received treatment. And the reason I also put grace in the title of this talk is that uh, so many of the letters were written with such grace on both sides, really. And this person is writing over 40 years since she received treatment at Frimley. And she says that she does hope it was worthwhile giving her a chance and how sincerely grateful she is and that her 71st birthday is coming up. Then the Armina writes back a very bespoke letter, lots of references to the weather in letters, both from patients and, and back to patients, and wishing her a happy birthday and hoping that she'll have many more years of usefulness to come. So really the feeling here is that, um, that this letter was not, it's kind of redundant. The former patient had already sent in their health record, but entirely in a spirit of being friendly and maintaining good communication, the Armina has taken the time to write back and acknowledge what the patient has said. And I think this was a real hallmark of, of this correspondence, that it was personalized. It always showed that the patient's letter had been read carefully and it was responded to. This wasn't the case throughout the period that I studied. Around this time in the 1950s, the letters took on a much more corporate feel and the Armin's department became the Frimley follow-up department. And uh, they became, uh, they used a pro forma where they just filled in the patient's name. Um, and that I think contributed to the demise of this follow-up operation. It people were far less likely to respond if they just received a standard letter. And again, I've written more about that in the paper that I published. So from these patients' gratitude took many forms. We've already talked about the letters, uh, but I think it's also important to note that the patients did thank the Armina for the treatment they received at Frimley, but also for her interest in their welfare. So many of them said, thank you for still taking an interest in me after all of these years. That meant a lot. It was a big feature of the gratitude. Many patients enclosed donations. Some of them were negligible, uh, two shillings, the equivalent of four pounds in today's money. But it was important for them to have this feeling of giving something back. I was intrigued by the number of references to stamps. At the beginning of the Second World War, the Armina wrote to patients saying, please could you remember to write to me of your own volition next year, rather than me reminding you because of the high cost of postage. So many patients then sent stamps to help the Armina with her work. There were some big donations as well. A couple of patients sent TVs, both for the staff and for the patients to alleviate the boredom of a sanatorium life. And one patient uh, donated 25 pounds, it was about a thousand pounds in today's money uh, to buy comfortable chairs for the nurse's room. And a plaque was affixed to them saying it was from a grateful male patient. That's what he wanted it to say. But my favorite are the personal gifts sent to the almoner by patients. My favorite one is a patient writing from New Zealand, 45 years. Every Christmas, he sent a calendar full of pictures of uh, New Zealand scenery and landscapes. Um, and even when he died, his wife wrote to say how grateful they were for the contact over the years. And he'd sadly died. But he con she continued to send a, a calendar to the almoner in his stead. So even though he saw three different almoners in a, a, the course of the time that he corresponded with the hospital. The sense was that there was such a good continuity that that rapport was maintained across the almoners that were in post at the time. So that was really special. It is not all sweetness and light though. 
And I was somewhat dismayed to find that the introduction of the NHS was met with considerable suspicion and quite a lot of confusion about what patients were and weren't allowed to do. So donations that had been sent prior to this um, were now thought to be not the done thing. This patient writes, I hear you under the government rule of thumb and donations don't interest you now. However, I'm still sending a postal order for you to, to use as you think best. And the almoner replies, trying to explain the nationalist system now and that they couldn't accept gifts towards the upkeep of the hospital, which to be fair, the almoner's uh, funds, the donations had never gone to the upkeep of the hospital. They were always for the benefit of other patients. Uh, but she kind of draws attention to the almoner's fund uh, where donations are always welcome. Here's another one um, where uh, the almoner points out that they don't receive so many contributions. And indeed, when I look at the almoner's report, there's a huge drop off in donations after the NHS is introduced. But it really still, um, the almoner was clear to note that these were still meaningful and how encouraging it was when old patients remembered Brompton in this fashion. And that goes into her report as well, how heartening it was to, for the, the patients still to remember them. Um, so I think there's a clear link here between the worthwhileness of doing this job of follow-up, the attention paid, and how the almoners responded as, as finding it encouraging that patients still uh, corresponded in this way. This was a, a really interesting letter from a former nurse who actually questioned whether she had ever had TB, but uh, nevertheless, um, she uh, was, was encouraged to keep corresponding. She had received treatment at Frimley. And she says, there is no mercy in the National Health Service. It was the worst thing that Bevan did to kill the voluntary hospitals. Up here in Lancashire, things are very different from London and the South. The people are hard and very callous. Oh my goodness, what a, what a dreadful perspective. Uh, but I guess one can understand this uh, because these were patients that had really benefited from the voluntary hospital system. And they did see it as a force for good. And the unknown entity of the NHS, although she was writing in 1960, NHS well established by then. Um, but, but these patients remained suspicious for quite a long time. There were other alarming things that I, stories that I discovered in the letters. And that was that there was an ongoing problem with stigma around having been treated for tuberculosis. Many, many examples of patients, former patients saying, I haven't told my family and kind of everybody ha has this feeling, um, I'm not going to disclose my address, uh, but I'll continue to write to you of my own volition. And, and, and this is an important, I think, thanking you once again for the good you've done me in the past, also for your kind inquiries. So it, it's not a, a letter of complaint, as it were. People can still be grateful and still, you know, be a little bit wary about being contacted by the almoner. So this was a, another uh, correspondent who wrote several letters like this, reminding the almoner that she was married to a man who had this dread of TB and should he find out that he would leave her. And also kind of implying that there was blackmail at issue. Lodges in the house or other strangers might see the letters and serious consequences may result. I'm not ungrateful, but I earnestly request that you do not send any more inquiries. I'm afraid to say that the almoner was tenacious though. Having set up this program, they really worked hard not to lose anybody from the program. And people that asked to not be written to received quite a, a moralizing letter with a leaflet explaining the importance of the research and um, really encouraging them to still stay in touch, kind of as a moral obligation. And I think, that, well, I know that the Amina interviewed people as they left Frimley. And at that point, because the Amina often says in the letters, you will remember 
that when I spoke to you, when you were discharged, that you agreed to keep in touch. So not happy about people wanting to opt out. And if they, they stop replying to letters, she would often write to family members or to the GP uh, or to health visitors to pay, pay a call on the, on the former patient. Again, here, uh, you know, uh, another patient that, that feels that actually somebody should call in person because he implies that somebody is actually reading his letters. Correspondence is not always confidential. And if people talk, then one is put to a disadvantage financially and socially. So it was really sad to see this ongoing stigmatization of having been treated for TB. I really enjoyed reading correspondence from, from this gentleman, uh, but this made me come up short. So he is, uh, wants to tell the almoner that his, his son uh, is well, but then he says, I'm glad I took to treatment properly and, and seriously. Also to the advice to get married. Wait, what? Was that part of the treatment recommendation that, that you should get married? to treat TB? Well, I didn't come across other references where patients had been encouraged to get married, uh, but I do know that the medical superintendent had, um, would often see patients on a very personal relationship. And especially the first one, Dr. Wingfield, the patients would often, rem often remember him in their letters and ask to be remembered to him. So I imagine this came from, from a conversation but it's all speculation. But the same correspondent writing now in uh, 1954 uh, still has this idea, and this was also common in the correspondence, that TB was somehow still hereditary. So this gentleman often told, gave the almoner lots of information about his son and his grandson. And for me, obviously played a huge part in his life but he's never told his family about being treated for TB. And he asks um, for the almoner not to contact him. Here, he sent photographs of his grandson to the almoner. And there's this lovely letter back uh, that actually he complained a bit about a, a feeling of pain in his chest. Uh, she arranges for him to be seen. Another important function of the almoner was if Patients reported that they weren't feeling so well, that she did something about it and arranged appointments. But she also says, I'm very pleased to hear your son enjoys excellent health and that um, thank you very much for the snap of your grandson. He looks like a very bonny boy. So finally, I've got two more letters to draw your attention to. One to stop me in my tracks it felt like it suddenly landed in the pages of a sensationalist novel. Here, uh, the wife of a former patient writes to say that, sorry, your letter hasn't been answered. I must tell you that Mr. W has been leading a double life for years with a woman in the old Kent Road and has children by him by all accounts. So now he has gone away and I don't know where he is. Trusting you will forgive me, for telling you my troubles, but I thought it best to explain to you. And I think this is just a testament, again, evidence of the, the, the way the patients felt they could confide in the almoner. And um, there were lots of very personalized, personal stories in the letters that it felt a real privilege to read. I do want to end on a happy note though, and that's this straightforward, lovely letter that sums up so many of the features of the letters that I, I came across in the archives. I am glad to say I'm still in good health and able to do my housework, thanks to the wonderful benefit I gained it from me and all I learned there with much gratitude, who was truly. So what did I learn from the Brompton letters? Working with archival materials is a privilege and a joy. And this is something that that I think we lose a bit when we enter the realm of the digital world, is that I had the privilege of handling those letters. I saw 
how the quality of the paper changed over the years, how it became thinner in the war years, how as patients aged, their handwriting became more scratchy and more difficult to read. Um, I saw, I noticed when the typewriter ribbon was changed on the arm in his typewriter. Uh, and that materiality, that sense of holding the actual artifact was a real, it was a joyful experience. I laughed and I cried uh, in uh, sitting, going through these, these letters. Um, I felt I got a privileged insight into voices that we don't usually hear, the working class patient. So often history records the voices of the privileged. And here these patients, they really came alive on the page. One could hear their dialect lips. One could, I mean, so many of them wrote from different parts of the world, such interesting stories. There was a lot of graft involved, both in tackling TV uh, by the patients, they were expected to do labor, but also the armoners. The work of follow-up was Herculean. And um, it took many hands and many years, but it was carried out with such care and diligence. And the graceful way in which the information was sought to maintain this personalized relationship that was often lifelong. It was really remarkable how, for how many years, the thickness of the stacks of letters as patients continued to correspond with the hospital. And finally, I think that they, one could see how how gratitude catalyzes gratitude. It was a kind of reciprocal relationship. The almoner was grateful to the patients for keeping in touch and the patients are grateful to the almoner uh, for keeping in touch. And um, that was remarkably successful. So I think there's some real lessons to be learned here about the role of gratitude, especially as we face this pandemic where just yesterday a government report released, um, which really speaks to the exhaustion and the uh, the incredible pressure on our healthcare workers. So I, I think my final message really is that, that gratitude works when it's bespoke. So it's directed at a person in a particular context and um, it's expressed with some sincerity and authenticity. So if any of you have a chance, and of course it needs to be merited, um, don't do it just for the sake of it, but if you feel somebody does deserve your gratitude, then I urge you, please, to express it. They might try and play it down and say, I'm just doing my job, but it will mean something to them and they will carry it in them. And it may just motivate them um, to go that little bit extra in tough times. OK, right. I will stop sharing now and I welcome your questions. Well, thank you so much, Giskin. I, I hope everybody can hear me okay. Uh, I'm Claire, for, for those of you who, who don't know. Um, well, thank you so much for a really fascinating talk. Um, I certainly learned a lot of things there about uh, parts of that collection. And um, yeah, as you, as you say in your final message, a lot to, to think about there in terms of the modern day climate and modern healthcare. So uh, yeah, absolutely, lots to think about there, thank you. So we've got a couple of uh, a couple of questions so far. Um, do feel free, everybody, to to keep uh, putting them in the chat. We'll get through as much as we can. Um, and Giskin's kindly said that she will. Uh, she's happy uh, for if we don't get to anybody's question, she's very happy to follow up by email. Uh, so first question is actually from uh, one of our team. I think it, it may be Kate. Um, very interesting question, actually. I find the emphasis on usefulness really interesting. Do you, get to, do you get a sense that patients endeavoured to be useful as a way of showing gratitude for their treatment? Yes, I think I very much did get a sense of that. It, I had a real hard time wrestling with how much patients felt obligated uh, as a result of having benefited from treatment. And there's no doubt that there was an undertone of that. There's a lovely poster in the Brompton Hospital today that says uh, appeal to gratitude. And it's a reminder of, <laughs> of uh, basically uh, one's obligation to be grateful and the privilege it was to be treated. And especially as uh, one had to be triaged to be able to be sent to Frimley for treatment, 
I think there was this sense that one was obliged to keep up those lifelong lessons learned at Frimley. That was very much part of it. Um, so I think, yes, there was an emphasis on, on usefulness and giving back to some extent. That did seem to be the baseline. Uh, one was, uh, patients were also told that they had to go to church to express their gratitude and that they had to write a letter to the subscriber. If, uh, the Brondon Hospital operated on a system where a subscriber would pay a certain amount to the hospital and then be able to recommend patients for treatment. So it was certainly an expectation that, that you express gratitude. And I think that sense of usefulness uh, was definitely part of it. It's a really interesting question. Thank you. Uh, we've got another one here from uh, Richard Bogle. Um, it's interesting the way the NHS was viewed when it first came in, rather different from now. The work you've presented is so insightful and fills one of the gaps in the study of medical history, which is the study of the patient's voice, which of course is, is true and you touched on that earlier. Do we know whether the follow-up data was collated into a research record, which was then used by the clinicians at the hospital to assess the outcomes of their treatment and fed back to the Brompton or used at Frimley? Oh, wow. Yes. Um, thank you, Richard. That is really interesting. Well, the, um, it was really interesting to see the iterations that this information went through and how it gradually became, it took on the veneer of objectivity. Um, so although we had the narrative in the letters and in uh, the Armina's books, it was then became a part of the annual reports of the Brompton. And also there were several um, kind of medical research council reports that were produced that reported on the statistics. So uh, the statistics books are, are quite something to look at. They're just columns of figures of survived, you know, working and so on. Um, graduated labor didn't quite take on uh, the way that the original uh, superintendents hoped that it would. And I think it was difficult to, to show a real difference. But often the figures were put into correspondence with figures from statistics from, from other sanatoria. So uh, that was of interest, is whether the regime at Midhurst, say, how that compared with Frimley. Um, but uh, I do have references to the report in the paper that I published. So if you scan the reference list, you'll be able to get the references for those reports. They certainly lose their individualization, but are nevertheless still important. Great, thank you. I've noticed a couple of people raising their hands. Uh, we're not able to unmute you, unfortunately, but if you just type your question in the chat, um, then hopefully we'll get that read out. Uh, we've got a question here from Jeff. Um, are there any letters from Grimsdyke Sanatorium associated with Harefield Hospital? Did it have its own almoner? I don't know if you're aware of anything. Oh, no, I'm not. Um, I'm not aware of that. I certainly didn't see them in the Brompton archives, but then my study was very focused on the Brompton. Um, and in some ways that's a real limitation. But this archive is kind of um, really special. Not many of these kinds of archives have survived. Uh, but that is, it's worth looking into. Um, I know certainly the correspondence from the medical superintendents ended up in some other archives as well. Uh, the personal correspondence of Dr. Wakefield is in a, a completely different archive that I've, I've not yet had a chance to go and, go and look at. But um, yes, it, it would be worth looking. I don't know, does, does Bart have the, uh, the Harefield Hospital records? We yes, we do. Um, they're sort of they're, they're quite patchy, unfortunately, because um, there was a, a flood which just did destroy quite a lot of the records. Um, so the records cover the Harefield's role in its early days as a, a military hospital for Australian uh, soldiers, as well as some later um, its later use as a TB sanatorium. But um, unfortunately, there, there's not very much there in terms of patient records, sadly. And um, yeah, just to follow on from Jeff's question, I, I'm certainly not aware of seeing anything relating to Grimsdyke, unfortunately, because that would be really interesting. Um, OK, we've got another one here. Let me just see they're flooding in, which is good, from Evelyn Pegley. Um, I think it's actually a comment more than a question, I think, but it's uh, interesting to read. I was seconded from the Middlesex Hospital to Harefield in 1958 as part of my general nursing training when Harefield was a TB hospital. 
I remember pushing patients in their beds out into the balconies for fresh air, maybe because uh, maybe they were too sick for the graft because I don't remember patients being sent out for walks or exercise. Very good idea and a fascinating talk. TB was the equivalent to today's mental health problems in that it felt it was a shameful thing to have, which you certainly touched on, Giskin, in terms of the stigma that surrounded it, uh, TB at the time. Oh, thank you, Evelyn. That's such an interesting, lovely personal testimony. <laughs> uh, so we have one from Jane now. Uh, thank you, fascinating. Do you feel the seeming lack of gratitude is more a reflection of a sense of entitlement from the NHS? I hope the pandemic changes this. I've been a Brompton patient for 20 years and frequently express my gratitude. Oh, Jane, that is so lovely to hear. Thank you so much. Actually, my work at the moment is focusing on gratitude in the pandemic. And I've written both a, uh, a case study of Clap for Carers and analysed social media. So I've done an analysis of tweets of gratitude to the NHS, uh, which has been really interesting. Um, entitlement is certainly um, something that comes up anecdotally when I speak to healthcare professionals, um, is that that seems, you know, if a patient comes in with an entitled attitude, it, it often mitigates gratitude. Um, so, so there's certainly a sense of that. And I think that, um, well, it's interesting because I've been having conversations for years with healthcare providers about this, mainly doctors, but also nurses. And they do seem to attribute uh, entitlement to a lack of gratitude so that, that they make that link. Um, and then there's the other side of the story, which is a little bit more philo philosophical. And that is that, well, why should we be grateful? We're entitled to care from the NHS. We pay our taxes. It's a service. And healthcare workers turn around and tell us that, you know, they don't want to be called heroes and that they are just doing their jobs. But I think the dynamics of gratitude are far more complex than just it being um, a work situation. When patients express gratitude, and I re recognize this is slightly different in the pandemic because often the gratitude is expressed not by patients uh, or not patients yet anyway. It's often anticipatory or it's kind of social recognition rather than um, thanking for a particular benefit. But um, the, the, there is a sense really that, um, that this entitlement thing is, is far more complicated than we might think. But th there is, many people think that, well, you know, it's a service like any other. So why should I need to feel grateful? But when people do thank, it's often not just for what, not just for the job they're doing. There's more to it. And that's why I would urge healthcare professionals to listen carefully to what patients are thanking them for even if they feel unworthy or humble or whatever, because that is important feedback about what people value. Um, so I think that's at the heart of it. Yeah, we've actually got a question that follows on a bit from that, from Arts Royal Brompton and Harefield, um, thanking you for your presentation and, and making a comment about um, what you think generally about inclusion and compassion in the NHS, as it seems sometimes a very brutal place to work. I'm thinking of the um, the levels of burnout and people who want to leave, obviously, particularly at the moment. Yeah. And, and the person asks, um, interestingly, um, are there any records you came across showing um, staff showing gratitude to each other? Well, yes. I mean, there's a there's an interesting orchestra analogy, isn't there? That when you play in an orchestra, I'm sure you want to impress the audience, but the the main person you want to impress is the conductor and the first violin. You you feel judged by your colleagues. And certainly all the uh, theory of uh, theories around gratitude in the workplace and, and the evidence is that it makes a very big difference whether you are noticed and appreciated by your colleagues. Um, patients' gratitude is welcomed, but often the difference is that, that relationship with your colleagues. Um, and I know several people working on how to reward people appropriately because especially with the emphasis on teamwork, it becomes quite insidious to single out individuals for recognition and appreciation by management. Often the rest of the team really resents that. And um, yeah, it's, it's a huge can of worms. Uh, but there are links, there's good evidence to link gratitude with well being, um, both the expressing of it and the receiving of it. 
um, especially actually the expressing of it. That's very well known. Um, and that's why I think it might be part of a duty of, of care really to allow people to express their gratitude and not just to shut it down. Um, I, I really think, I, I mean, I've got, I started off hugely optimistic that, that if we handle gratitude better, it would make a material difference to people's working conditions. Um, and I think, I think there's still room for that argument, but one has to be a little bit cautious about obliging people to feel grateful and also over claiming for it. Uh, it's not probably, you know, workforce management, uh, the lack of resources, understaffing, those are the real things that drive burnout. And gratitude has a part to play, but it's not a panacea. So I've had to dial back my expectations somewhat. <laughs> Uh, interesting question from Louise Anderson. Um, do you think the patient's expressions of gratitude um, were related in some way to their class origins? That is interesting. Um, I think that by the time Frimley was taking uh, private patients, there were some very well-to-do people that also were obliged to write in uh, once a year with the reports of their health. Um, but uh, was it all tied up with a voluntary healthcare system? difficult to know. Um, I was certainly impressed by the levels of literacy. And um, I, yeah, I, I don't know, do you, are working class people generally more grateful? Do they have less of a sense of entitlement? I do remember one letter that said, I was a private patient and paid for my care at the time. Therefore, uh, and it is doubtful whether I ever had TB. Therefore, please do not continue to write to me. Um, but the, that one is the only one that really stood out. Um, I'm, I'm, I, I would worry about kind of overgeneralizing about class. Um, I'm really interested in language. I think that gratitude is constructed in that, that moment where words are, are put to paper rather than trying to diagnose people's inner psychologies uh, as a result of what they say or what they write. Because uh, you just end up speculating, don't you? Um, but certainly there was this, well, I don't, I, I love the, the fact that patients were never patronized. And that seemed to suggest that everybody was in it together and the almoner didn't view herself as, as better than, than anybody else really. It was very much a kind of peer to peer relationship. I think. Thank you. And we've got two questions about the lady almoner, uh, which uh, if you don't mind, just because I know we're, we're kind of short of time now, whether you could perhaps answer them both together. Um, first of all, another one from the archives team. Has there been much written about the role of the lady almoner across the hospital sector? It was clearly a role where feminine characteristics were seen as um, essential. And Jane Inslee asks, when did the almoners get scrapped? Present issues in hospitals could in many cases have been addressed by people performing the almoner function, which touches on the gap between nursing and social care. Yes, absolutely. So yeah, really interesting. Um, so uh, the feminine characteristics of the almoner, uh, I, I do, I, the almoner most, mostly has been written about the relationship with money and how the almoners were so keen to distance themselves from just being seen as a person that dealt with money. And there have been some really interesting papers on that. Uh, again, that I, I, I've written about in, in my paper, I can't quite remember the, um, oh, it's, um, is it Gosling? Yes, uh, George Gosling has written a, some really interesting work on that. So that is worth uh, exploring, I think, uh, also touching on professional identity. And the, yeah, this is the paper actually, it's gender, money and professional identity medical social work and the coming of the British National Health Service. So that's absolutely the one to get uh, George Gosling. Uh, it's in the bibliography of my paper. Um, the almoners gradually were phased out uh, after the introduction of the NHS. People weren't fired. <laughs> so they generally saw out their period of work as the almoner. But they also, I know the almoners at Frimley um, lob lobbied for a change in name. Could we be called the Department of Social Work rather than the almoners department, because they said the public never really understood what the almoners uh, were doing and what, what they stood for and what their role was. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I, really interesting. I just want to pick up on uh, two more bits in the chat. One is about gray text, a compliment to day text. I've had no luck in trying to persuade the Brompton to maybe take up gray text. I think the connotations with day text are so uh, it, it's just a non-starter. 
um, uh, that this is a bit of jargon, not everybody will know what we're on about, but you can Google it. And interestingly, David has said in the chat, the BBC TV series Hospital, ah, that is my current project. I'm analyzing clips from Hospital of gratitude, both before COVID and the current series and looking at those conversations and how gratitude plays out there. I'm so pleased you mentioned that. Um, oh, I see you've just written to me rather than putting it in the chat. But um, <laughs> I, I am absolutely investigating uh, gratitude in episodes of Hospital as a prelude, I hoped, to being able to get into the Brompton and do some ethnographic work um, for the situation today. So thank you for mentioning that. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you so much, Giskin, for uh, answering those questions and for your excellent presentation and for being so uh, wonderfully on time. So we now just have uh, one minute remaining for me to just wrap a few things up. So once again, to, to express our thanks to Giskin for being the first in uh, our new talk series. Um, we, as Kate mentioned at the start, we are recording this. And um, so we will be making the recording available on our YouTube channel. And I will share the link to that in the chat as we speak for anyone who's interested. So there's quite a few videos on there already. So you can amuse yourselves when you're, when you're waiting for this. So we hope to get that up and running in the next couple of weeks. Um, and then our next talk is coming up on the 29th of July, um, same time, six or seven. And that's Iria Suarez talking about a better childhood for all children, designing the modern space for sick children in East London, 1850 to 1900. So Iria has uh, worked with, uh, with us before uh, looking at the archives we hold of two former hospitals, the Queen Elizabeth Hospital for Children and the East London Hospital for Children. So that should be uh, another fascinating talk. And if you haven't already got your tickets, you can book them by Eventbrite. And I will put that message in the chat for everybody as well. Um, and yes, I think um, Giskin, if you're, if you're still happy for me to include your email address in the chat and anybody who, who perhaps wants to follow up with something, can do. Yes, of course. Um, I've just done so. I'm also happy to stay on the call for five minutes if anybody wants to carry on chatting. But a huge thank you to everybody that's come along this evening. Um, and it's so, so wonderfully heartening to see so many people so grateful for the care that they've received and quite a few Brompton patients. So that is absolutely delightful. Thank you so much. And thank you very much. And yes, I think that's probably all from us. So. It just remains for me to thank you all for coming and for being a great audience and we hope to see you again next time. Thank you very much. Bye.